One day in 1994, Jeffrey Katzenberg, a disgruntled former Disney executive who had left the company due to being passed up for a promotion, teamed up with famous director Steven Spielberg, and some other dude as well, and they decided to form their own movie studio. That studio was DreamWorks, and in 1997, they debuted with their first feature film, The Peacemaker, starring George Clooney. However, we do not care about The Peacemaker starring George Clooney, because today we are really talking about DreamWorks subsidiary, DreamWorks Animation. Over the course of about two weeks, I marathoned all 45 feature films they've released since their inception, and now I'm going to be reviewing and ranking every single one. Now, one question you might be asking is, of all animation studios, why DreamWorks? And the answer is quite simple because I think DreamWorks easily has the most fascinating library of every mainstream animation company. Incidentally, I actually did do a Disney marathon a few years back, and quite frankly, I don't think that reviewing and ranking video would be all that interesting. They had a few peaks and valleys, particularly in the Renaissance and post-Renaissance eras, but for the most part, it was a pretty straight shot of, that one's fine, that one's fine, that one's fine. That one's maybe a little better. You get the idea. For a majority of the marathon, the quality felt pretty consistent, and I didn't feel all that strongly about it. DreamWorks, on the other hand, they just go all over the place with seemingly no pattern, and generally with a much wider range in quality as well. No other animation studio could release one of my favorite animated movies ever, and one of my least favorite animated movies ever, within a couple of months of each other, and have that feel like a pretty regular occurrence. Like, imagine if Disney released The Lion King, and then later that same year they released Chicken Little, and then they got nominated alongside one another. That's why this marathon seemed like it would be fun. So, how this video will be structured. I'm going to be reviewing each movie in release order, starting in 1998 and ending in 2023. If you only care about my thoughts on one particular movie, there will be timestamps in the description, and the ranking will be given its own section at the end. Also, spoiler alert for pretty much every single one. Without any further ado, let's get into it, starting with... In the early days, DreamWorks' business model was basically to appeal to the Disney market. It is absolutely not a coincidence that so many of DreamWorks' early films came out around the same time as a Disney or Pixar movie with a similar premise. Sometimes, particularly with their 2D stuff, it was more about trying to emulate the feeling of one of those movies. A musical epic loosely based on a classic story, a silly, unserious comedy in a historical setting, fun animal friends, etc while at other times, it was more about outright ripping them off. Their first film, Ants, falls into the latter category. It's not even just the premise and aesthetics in this case, it's even thematically very similar to Bugs Life, with both of them being about the working class rising against the ruling class and seizing the means of production, you know, all that jazz. Remember, Katzenberg worked at Disney. He probably knew about Bugs Life well before there was any public information about it. A while back, I watched a documentary about the creation of Pixar, and in it, they talked about how they spent years ironing out the script and storyboards for the first Toy Story. They knew that if they wanted the movie to actually be widely successful and have a long-lasting legacy, relying on it being the first 3D animated movie ever made simply wouldn't be enough. And it paid off. Toy Story remains a beloved classic to this day, and is still Pixar's flagship franchise. Apparently they're making a fifth one now, people still aren't tired of it. However, considering the main reason Ants was made was so it could come out at the same time as Bugs Life, they didn't really have time to put that level of thought into it. Despite being moderately well received when it came out, it really doesn't have much of a lasting legacy beyond being DreamWorks Animation's first movie. It's not like it had a gimmick like being the first 3D animated movie ever made to stand out like Toy Story did, but it did have something. If there's one thing that early DreamWorks was known for, it was having a level of edginess that simply wasn't as present in other Western animated movies from the time, including language, or crudeness, or overt violence, or sexual references that companies like Disney or Pixar usually like to steer clear of. People tend to credit Shrek with starting this trend, but it was actually already present in Ants. In fact, I'd say it was a lot more present in Ants. 
people just don't really remember it here because the movie isn't, well, good. You've probably noticed that I've been talking a lot more about the context surrounding the movie than I have about the movie itself, and that's because there really isn't a whole lot to say. It's not even really boring, it's just kind of boring. The main character is just some uninteresting asshole with very little actual agency in the plot. His sole motivation is to get laid, and everything else just sort of happens around him. There aren't any particularly good jokes, the animation is pretty stiff, and character design... Well, that's always been pretty hit or miss with DreamWorks movies. Clearly, that goes right back to the very start. It's far from the worst thing they've ever made, but unless you're doing some personal homework and want to see the origins of DreamWorks for yourself, there really isn't any reason to watch this. Prince of Egypt is a vast, vast improvement over Ants. Of the whopping four times DreamWorks attempted 2D animation, this is easily the best one. It's got its flaws for sure, the pacing is a little awkward in the first half, and some of the dialogue between characters can feel a bit floaty and impersonal, but they are easily overshadowed by how much this movie does right. That soundtrack. My personal favorites are Deliver Us and The Plagues, but I don't think any of them are weak. But The Plagues, man. Even if I wouldn't consider this a 10 out of 10 movie overall, that is definitely a 10 out of 10 scene. For me, it's easily what takes this from a good movie to a great movie. That, as well as the villain, Ramses, who is easily one of the better ones DreamWorks has produced over the years. His whole complex about having an easy way out that he simply isn't able to bring himself to use because of his own pride, the weak link, and all that, as well as being somewhat torn on the whole thing because of his formerly positive relationship with his brother, it's all interesting to watch. While DreamWorks didn't make 2D animated movies for very long, I'm glad they managed to sneak in at least one undeniable classic before giving up on the medium. The Road to El Dorado is a movie that's had a relatively interesting history. It bombed when it came out. Like, hard. Didn't even have a particularly high budget for an animated movie at the time, and it still wasn't able to make it back. However, people rediscovered it, it gained a cult classic status, and now, people love it. As for myself, I think it's a decent, relatively funny movie, with some good music, and some very serious structural problems. Like, the plot structure in this movie is completely out of whack. It starts right away with the title of the movie. There is very little The Road To in this movie. They get to El Dorado less than 20 minutes in, and then the rest of the movie is spent just hanging around there. The title leads you to believe that it's more of an adventure movie than it really is, when it's actually more of a comedy crime with light adventure elements. They clearly didn't really know how to end the movie either. The climax sort of happens at a completely arbitrary point, and then it's over with just as abruptly. And it's not likely to be that great a climax even if it didn't come out of nowhere. Pretty much, the main antagonistic force of the movie is that Cortez is approaching the city, but then the climax is them just sealing off the entrance by collapsing a cave, and then Cortez shows up and doesn't see the city and nothing happens. There wasn't even much of a ticking time bomb element, because we barely see Cortez before this scene. Keep in mind though, I do like the movie. As I said, the songs are great. Like, they got the Elton John and Tim Rice duo from The Lion King, of course that came out well. Julio and Miguel are a fun duo. It's very easy to see why they've become iconic in spite of the movie they're from underperforming. I just think the public opinion might be overcompensating a little bit to make up for ignoring this movie when it first came out. I don't think it's a masterpiece, but it definitely didn't deserve to bomb. Also, I do think it's pretty funny how there's a scene in the movie that straight up implies that Julio and Miguel really are gods and just don't realize it. Like, that volcano scene. They never go back and explain what happened there, so I'm just left having to assume that Tulio really was the one who prevented the eruption simply by yelling, Stop! <laughs> Yeah, I don't think every joke in this movie is funny, but when they do hit, they can really hit. At some point in this marathon, I was going to have to call and question what actually counted. Do I count the stuff that technically has the DreamWorks name on it, but is really more of an Ardman product? Do I count the stuff that was released straight to DVD? 
Do I count series movies? Eventually, I decided that the best source would be the list of productions on DreamWorks Animation's own website, and, as it turns out, the Aardman movies are on there, as well as Troll Hunter's Rise of the Titans. No Joseph, King of Dreams, however, so sorry to all 13 fans of that movie. So, Chicken Run. It's good, in very simple ways. This was Aardman's first feature film after making a few shorts in the 80s and 90s, and it ends up feeling like one of their shorts pretty appropriately paced out to be feature length. Aside from the animation, which is just great by the way, the characters are really expressive, and there are a bunch of creative set pieces and funny visual gags, my favorite part of Aardman's movies has to be the voice acting. The dialogue is always really simple, even cliché to a degree at times, but the delivery from the actors always manages to make it funny. Even some of the emotional beats hit. The scene at the beginning is probably one of the better first act deaths out there. The heavy implication that this is a regular occurrence really helps sell it. It's nothing incredible, but it's a very solid, easy to like movie. The year is 2002. The Academy Awards have just created a new category for the Best Animated Feature Film. A category that seemingly was actually created with good intentions before it became a dumping ground for movies that the Academy doesn't really care about. And the nominees are... Monsters, Inc. Jimmy Neutron, Boy Genius, for some reason. And the one and only... Shrek. And that was what won. Until now... Pixar had been the king of theatrical 3D animation, while Disney had been the king of theatrical animation in general. And in the first year a category solely for animated features exists, Pixar are beaten, and Disney isn't even nominated. Not only had Disney lost, they had lost to a movie that was actively making fun of them. With typical Disney elements like musical numbers, animal sidekicks, or plot elements like True Love's Kissed usually either being portrayed as annoying in-universe, or taking some kind of subversive, often comedic twist, or both. And it's not just Disney either, it's the classic fairy tale formula as a whole. I think this is best illustrated when Princess Fiona enters the scene. Her whole bit where she's trying to go through the motions of a classic fairy tale, but the other characters just aren't playing along, and her getting increasingly annoyed at them for it, is just hilarious. It is often called into question whether Shrek actually ages well, or if things like the use of contemporary music and jokes and references that were a lot more relevant back then than they are now is going to date it, but that just isn't happening. The references aren't too distracting, and are generally over with pretty quickly, and as for the whole parody angle, I think as long as the classic Disney and fairy tale formula is irrelevant, Shrek will be as well. There is another angle to this movie as well. It also tries to send a message about judging based on first impressions in a pretty typical rom-com plot. I don't feel as strongly about this element, but it's good for what it is. I was originally kind of annoyed by the whole miscommunication bit, for a movie claiming to be a parody, that felt like a pretty bad trope to just use completely unironically. I always wished they had done something different, like subvert it comedically, or maybe subvert it by fixing it, have their follow actually come from somewhere instead of it just being a misunderstanding, like maybe one of them gets cold feet about where things are headed, but assuming there was any attempt at that, it was kinda lost on me. However, I think the forced misunderstanding trope actually works well in Shrek. Because although Fiona is talking about herself, let's be honest. That version of herself is an ogre. What she's saying about her true form still applies to Shrek. Huh. I hadn't thought about it that way. I guess what happened in the movie actually was kind of what I was hoping for, even if the way it happened was pretty convoluted. You know, YouTube comment sections can often be a cancer on internet film discussion, but every once in a while, you'll come across a comment like this one that actually provides interesting, valuable discussion surrounding a film. Like, I'm genuinely less annoyed by that plot beat now. Thanks, at JaJaJazPootin8927. And all of that isn't even mentioning Lord Farquaad, who, while he doesn't top my personal list of favorite DreamWorks villains, is still quite funny, with a lot of iconic, well-delivered lines, and Mike Myers' voice performance, which is... just legendary. Ow! You know, Spirit, Stallion of the Cimarron, in order of release, the first DreamWorks movie I had never seen prior to this marathon, it was almost something pretty special. 
feature-length movie telling an animal-based story without giving the animals the ability to talk, and having very little dialogue as a result, instead primarily relying on the animation and music to tell the story, it's a pretty interesting idea. Unfortunately, they weren't brave enough to fully commit to that idea. While the horse doesn't talk, they do bring in Matt Damon to narrate the horse's internal thoughts, and it's always massively redundant whenever his voice shows up. Constantly throughout the movie, the visuals will be doing perfectly fine telling the story, and then Matt Damon will just come in with, Hey, you see that thing that's happening right now? It sure is happening right now. That's not the only issue either. I think the dated CG can be distracting, but is somewhat forgivable. However, the really unfitting Brian Adams soundtrack is a lot harder to ignore. Both it and the aforementioned narration feel like decisions that were made to try and make the movie more marketable, rather than for any artistic intent. I suppose I could respect that if it worked, but then the movie didn't do that well anyway, so you kinda just made it worse for no reason. This is one of the few movies in the marathon that I would describe as middling. There are a few really effective moments in this movie, but almost all of them end up being somewhat undercut by some poor decision. Sinbad was DreamWorks last attempt at a 2D animated film, and unfortunately it's not a great one to go out on. It's got some of the qualities the previous 2D films had. Obviously the character animation is still good, and there are definitely some pretty memorable scenes, but overall, this one is pretty subpar. Sinbad just isn't a good protagonist. He's an unlikable, egotistical asshole, and the movie tries to give him a redemption arc, but it kind of fails because he has almost no agency in the plot. In fact, it's more than halfway through the movie before he does anything at all, really, and anything redemptive he does is something he was either forced or nagged into doing. The plot is also really stupid. The villain's motivation is that she's a god of chaos that wants to destabilize the peace, and there's a book MacGuffin that keeps the peace. So, instead of doing something that would make sense, like stealing the book for herself and leaving it at that, she at first tries to make a deal with the protagonist to steal it for her, and he agrees, but then he just doesn't do it, and then she steals it for herself anyway. Like, why even involve him at all if you're gonna do that? If you left him out of it, you could have just framed him, or anyone else for that matter, and no one would be any the wiser. The only reason Sinbad knew it was her was because she asked him to steal it for her. There's also this whole element that basically serves as the ticking time bomb where, when Sinbad is sentenced to death after being framed for stealing the book, this prince guy gives him a chance to go and get the book back by volunteering to be executed in his place if he doesn't return, which is like, what? Apparently that's a thing you can do in this world's legal system, and this was also part of the villain's plan from the start? If you just needed an excuse for this character to go off on a MacGuffin hunting adventure with a ticking time bomb element, I feel like there are less nonsensical ways you could have set it up. Even the adventure isn't that good once it gets going. All of the 2D DreamWorks movies have some dated CG in them, but I think this is easily the one where it's the biggest problem. A very large part of the appeal of this whole section of the movie is traveling to different locations and fighting a bunch of monsters, but it doesn't really have any impact when none of it looks like it's on the same plane of existence as the characters. So yeah, I wish the short era of 2D DreamWorks animation at least went out on a better film. However, even their worst 2D film is better than nearly half of their 3D films, so this small catalog at least has that going for it. Shrek 2 was DreamWorks Animation's first sequel, and somehow, it's even better than the first. It takes everything that worked about the first movie, does it better, adds more stuff that also works, and generally leaves behind whatever didn't work. It finds a whole new angle to take with satirizing the classic fairy tale formula by continuing the story after the supposed happily ever after from the first one. You generally don't do that with classic fairy tale stories, that's probably why for a long time Disney never made any follow-ups to their classic movies, and when they finally started trying to, no one liked them. With a few exceptions. But Shrek 2 manages to pull it off in a way that takes the inherent subversion of doing so, and combines it with an expansion of the themes from the first movie. 
Shrek and Fiona were able to move past their own insecurities and prejudices and be happy with their unorthodox happily ever after, but that doesn't automatically mean that the other, more traditional fairy tale characters that also exist in this world are willing to play along. This is kind of why I prefer Fairy Godmother as a villain to Lord Farquaad. She's like this powerful individual who tries to enforce the status quo because it benefits her and her son, and actively plays on Shrek's insecurities regarding his relationship with Fiona, while Farquaad was kind of just the big bad of the general anti-ogre resentment that was present in that movie. Fiona's parents are a great addition to the story for this reason as well, and her father's arc is really satisfying. And not to mention, I think this one's funnier as well. When I think of the funniest jokes and character interactions from the Shrek franchise, there definitely are plenty from the first movie, but this one has the dinner scene, human Shrek and horse donkey, the cops parody, Puss in Boots who provides a pretty fun shake-up to Shrek and Donkey's dynamic, and, of course, that climax. It increases the scale from the first movie by just the right amount without making it feel bloated, and I honestly think that the use of I Need a Hero in this scene is on par with All Star and I'm a Believer from the first movie in terms of how great a song choice it was. Shrek 2 is a masterpiece, plain and simple. I don't want to jump on the hate train for Shark Tale simply because it's what I'm supposed to do, but there really is just that little to defend in this movie. What can I even say about this that hasn't already been said by everyone else? That the visual look of the movie is really uncreative and ugly? That the setting is just New York with a green hue over everything and a bunch of fish-related words that could very generously be referred to as puns? That it was obviously only set underwater because Finding Nemo had been released the previous year? That the character design sucks, my personal least favorite being that Angelina Jolie fish? that the plot is a generic, liar-revealed story, and that the main character is an annoying moron whose only real role in the plot is actively making every situation he gets into worse, and relies solely on the fact that he's played by Will Smith for audiences to be captivated by him at all? Yeah, that sure aged well, didn't it? Or have people already moved past that now? A year might as well be a century in pop culture. Or how about that it's aggressively unfunny, containing the single worst example of a fart joke, and the single worst example of a reference joke that I've ever seen. Like, I don't want to play the whole clip because of copyright, but the joke was that these two were just talking, and then they get interrupted by Baby's Got Back being played for a second. Was that even a joke? Did people just find that song that funny back in 2004? It's not even the first time DreamWorks used it, but at least in Shrek it was relegated to the Swamp Karaoke short instead of being in the actual movie. But I'd wager that, if you've seen or read any review of this movie before now, even just a single one, you've heard all of that before, because nearly everyone who talks about Shark Tale dislikes it for these same reasons. I guess I don't think it's the worst DreamWorks movie, but it is definitely the worst one that somehow got nominated. No one remembers Madagascar 1. If I asked you right now to remember something from the Madagascar franchise, I can almost guarantee that whatever you thought of was from one of the sequels or spin-offs. While watching this for the marathon, I asked myself, why does no one remember the first one? The answer turned out to be quite simple. It's because nothing happens! I don't know if I've ever seen a movie with this little going on. Pretty much the entire cultural impact of this first one consists of the penguins, they're consistently the best part of this franchise, shame they're barely even in this one, as well as that one song that wasn't even made for the movie, but everyone associates with the franchise now. If you remember anything else, I would wager that you remember the main conflict being that Alex starts to want to eat everyone because he's a carnivore, and you'd be half right. That does happen, but it's hardly the main conflict, seeing as it doesn't even get brought up until more than an hour into this hour and 19 minute movie. Most of the runtime is just really bad slapstick, with a bit of really bad potty humor, and a bit of fur bait under the guise of butt humor, following the four massively annoying main characters. If, for whatever reason, you feel like revisiting the Madagascar franchise, just skip this one. Any element that is even remotely memorable is far more prominently featured in the sequels anyway. Repeat a lot of what I said about Chicken Run, really, though I'd say I like this one a good amount more. I've always loved the Wallace and Gromit series, and while a lot of people tend to prefer the 90s shorts, the movie has always been my personal favorite entry. 
I think that might just come down to the larger scope this movie has compared to the shorts. The shorts had very few characters outside of Wallace and Gromit themselves, which definitely worked in its own way, but this whole town of vegetable lovers has so much personality, and many of my favorite jokes and line deliveries in this movie come from the various townsfolk. That's of course not to say that Wallace and Gromit themselves aren't an endearing duo in this as well. I'd say there are plenty of scenes in this movie that are on par with what they get up to in the shorts. Their antics surrounding the invention of the week are definitely more out there in the movie, when it tended to be a bit more grounded in the shorts. Maybe this is why some people don't like the movie as much, but to me it's fine as long as it's still funny. And to me, the whole experiment gone wrong horror movie werewolf parody that results from the invention is hilarious. I also do appreciate the various scenes which serve as a homage to scary scenes from other movies. The Jurassic Park one is particularly memorable. I guess it should also be pointed out that this was the only other time that something that was technically a DreamWorks movie won Best Animated Feature. It's kind of a shame they've never been able to win again, spare this one time when it was really more of an Aardman win, because they've absolutely deserved it a few times since. I was not expecting much from Over the Hedge. Looking at the poster and even footage from the movie, it doesn't look any different from the mostly forgettable subpar catalog DreamWorks have been releasing around this point in time or any other generic animated movie from the 2000s. It's not like DreamWorks tried to sell it as anything different either. This is probably one of the oldest movies that I actually remember the marketing for when it was new, and all of the trailers prominently featured that burping ABCs moment, as if that was some of their best material. It's not like I'd never seen it before, either. I had seen it as a kid, and I liked it then, but when I was a kid, I also watched the live-action Avatar movie and liked it. My opinion from back then means nothing. Surprisingly, though, it actually holds up. And I don't just mean that it's more tolerable than I expected, or that it's a guilty pleasure. It's genuinely a pretty good movie. The villains are this HOA president who gets progressively more unhinged as the situation around her develops, and this exterminator who is so passionate and self-serious about his job that it's honestly kind of endearing. And there's also a bear thrown into the mix, because why not? The concept of animals versus housing development, or animals versus bigger animal, isn't anything that unique, but throughout the movie, it increasingly gets more and more extreme, and eventually gets so absurd that it's just hilarious. The climax of this movie is like 15 minutes of some of the craziest shit I've ever seen in a movie that started off relatively grounded. And along the way, it throws in a bunch of pretty funny commentary on American suburbia. What is that? That is an SUV. Humans ride around in it because they are slowly losing their ability to walk. Jeepers, it's so big! How many humans fit in there? Usually, one. Plus, the Ben Fold soundtrack absolutely kicks ass. Like, seriously, even if you aren't sold on the movie itself, I implore you to at least check that out. Honestly, I don't think a Best Original Song nomination for Heist would have been unearned. Keep in mind, this isn't an amazing movie. Not every joke lands, the squirrel in particular can be a bit obnoxious at times, and the plot does have some of the usual caveats that come with the liar revealed trope. Like, a bit of forced drama, and the liar being maybe a bit easily forgiven at the end. Though, in total fairness, the latter was played for a joke to some degree. I have to say, easily the biggest surprise of the entire marathon. It's flawed, for sure, but it's kind of a gem hidden amongst a mostly lackluster streak. Flushed Away is the last Ardman collaboration in this video, and it's like Ardman doing a bad imitation of itself. I'm not even sure why this was made. Did Ardman just want to experiment with CG? Did they just want to release something that used the World Cup as a plot point around the same time as the actual World Cup? I have to think about it from these external viewpoints because I just don't see anything in the movie itself that made two prominent animation studios decide this was something worth putting $150 million into. Clearly people see something in this movie because it has its fans. Can't say I'm one of them. Being CG, the animation lacks the inherent charm of stop motion and also generally just doesn't look as good. The humor is mostly a bunch of tired cultural stereotypes and screaming slugs. I suppose there are a few jokes that kinda work, but they're very few and far between, and the plot just feels like a checklist of beats that usually come with this high-lifer-meets-the-common-folk trope. 
This is the part where they meet and hate each other. This is the part where they wind up in a bad situation together. This is the part where they start liking each other just cuz. So on, so forth. Not to mention, I really hate the main character. He's such an unlikable wuss. This is the first movie in the marathon I've particularly disliked, where that isn't the overwhelmingly prevailing opinion of it, so I wonder what the appeal is. I tried looking at Letterboxd reviews, but all of the top reviews are just people making British jokes and saying they think the main character is hot. I don't see it. Maybe that's why I don't like the movie. The opening montage is kinda funny. The rest of it sucks. Like Shark Tale, disliking this movie almost seems ubiquitous with internet film culture. And no wonder, it dropped the ball HARD compared to the first two movies. It has a lot of problems, but I think possibly the core issue with this movie is that it largely forgets what the point of Shrek was. In both of the first two movies, and even the fourth one, you could point to some subversion of the classic fairy tale formula which serves as the baseline for the story. What if you had a fairy tale where none of the characters fit the usual stereotypes? What if you continued the story of a fairy tale after the supposed happily ever after? What if a character from a fairy tale questions if their supposed happily ever after is really what they want? Shrek the Third doesn't really have that. It's basically just about Shrek being a commitment phobe. Fiona's father dies in a really tonally confusing scene, and for some reason Shrek is next in line to be king, even though I don't think that's how marrying into royalty works. So, in order to abdicate, Shrek has to go and find the only other heir. This kid, Arthur, played by Justin Timberlake. I guess Shrek also finds out he's going to be a father, so he has to bond with the kid in order to learn how to parent or something. Arthur Pendragon is easily the most annoying character in any Shrek movie. They lean so hard into the bullied loser kid angle, everything about it is just so on the nose, and Justin Timberlake's terrible voice performance definitely does not help. Puss and Donkey are also... there, even though they have absolutely nothing to do in this movie. There's actually a pretty funny way of measuring just how irrelevant they are in this one. This is a Twitter screenshot. I don't know exactly how widespread it was, but it was a pretty popular meme. I used to see it all the time, and misogyny aside, there is a problem with the response portion of the meme. If you were able to spot it without me spelling it out to you, I would applaud you, but it means that you're especially familiar with Shrek 3, of all things. That is not Donkey. That is Puss in Donkey's body. They give these characters a body swap subplot in this movie, and the joke was that Puss tried to do his cute eyes thing, but couldn't pull it off with Donkey's face. This was obviously an attempt at giving these characters something semi-memorable to do in this movie, but clearly it didn't work because people don't even remember the biggest joke they make with the concept. They also find Merlin at some point, I guess... Whatever, even if what they were doing here was better executed, what does any of this have to do with the premise of Shrek? Why is it even set in this fairy tale world anymore? There are two other main subplots in this movie, and in them there's at least some kind of attempt at utilizing the whole fairy tale angle. They're still not good, though. One of these is that Prince Charming, who is the main villain in this one, decides to start gathering a bunch of fairy tale villains so they can all get revenge, I think. While Fiona talks to a bunch of other princesses about how they don't just have to be damsels in distress. This one doesn't really go anywhere, because when they storm in during the climax, it's already so bloated with characters from the other subplots that nearly everyone just kind of stands there with nothing active they can do. And then it's fine anyway, because Justin Timberlake gives a speech about how they should all just be friends, and everyone immediately listens to him. It is a bit more watchable than many of DreamWorks' other bad movies, it's got an occasional mildly funny joke, there are a few parts that still feel like they belong in a Shrek movie, but with how drastic a shift in quality it is from the second one, I can see why it's as hated as it is. I was not expecting much from B-Movie. Looking at the poster and even footage from the movie, it doesn't look any different from the mostly forgettable, subpar catalog DreamWorks have been releasing around this point in time, or any other generic animated movie from the 2000s. And yeah, this one's a lot more in line with what you'd expect it to be. Like, it's largely just ants again, except with bees. 
It's also set in Central Park with a New York-based comedian playing the main character. The main character has the same motivation about not being happy with his role in an overly uniformed society. It has the same themes about workers rising up against oppressors. It even repeats a lot of the same gags. Easily the biggest difference in this one is the heavy involvement of human characters and how the movie turns into court drama, of all things, where the bees sue humans for ownership of all honey. It also gets really weird because it implies an interspecies romance between the main bee and the human woman. If you haven't seen this movie, it might sound so stupid that it's funny, but I guarantee you, no one would remember this movie if it wasn't a meme. Again, just like Ants, it's not even really boring, it's just kind of boring. Nearly every joke with the humans is just people screaming because they see a bee. The whole court scene has no tension because the main characters pretty much never lose the upper hand. Like, really, you set this guy up as like the best lawyer in the history of lawyers, and he's easily bested by a bee? And then the third act goes in a completely bizarre direction with a conflict that seems completely separate from everything before it, where bees realize that they have to keep working because everything depends on their pollination. Like, okay, what does that have to do with anything that happened before this? Was the movie running short? Probably the biggest redemptive quality is Patrick Warburton. I mean, he kind of just does the same thing he does in everything else he's in, but what he does in everything else he's in is funny, so it's funny in this. That makes this the first of two DreamWorks movies where Patrick Warburton is one of the only funny parts. I think Kung Fu Panda is DreamWorks' best franchise. There are definitely some individual movies that I like just as much, if not more, but I don't think they have another series where the movies are as consistently good as these ones. The animation and character design is great in all of them, both 3D and 2D. Yeah, these movies have some 2D animated segments, and they look great. It makes me kind of wish they used them a bit more. The action is great, with the prison break scene in this one especially being a highlight, and Poe is a good protagonist. I do prefer him a bit in the sequels. In this first one, I find his transformation from clumsy fool to someone who could best an opponent that his far more experienced fellow students and even his teacher didn't stand a chance against to be a bit of a difficult sell, but his arc about his insecurity regarding his role and learning to accept it was well done. Also, I just really like Mr. Ping. He has to be one of my favorite parent figure characters in anything. They strike a great balance between him having a genuinely loving relationship with his son while also being kind of a comedic asshole as a businessman. There's a scene in this movie where he talks with Poe and gives him an important life lesson which serves as a major turning point for his character by revealing that his restaurant's signature dish is basically a scam. It's great. But where this series, mostly the first two, especially stands out is with its villains. Tai Lung is easily one of the best examples out there of the former student-turned-evil trope, and he serves as great juxtaposition to Poe when it comes to the reveal regarding the Dragon Scroll. Poe was confused at first, but eventually able to accept it, but when Tai Lung finds out that the secret is that there is no secret, there's nothing to being the Dragon Warrior other than himself, he kind of just breaks, and it's a great moment. The fight does become a bit slapsticky after this, and when it does, I have to admit that I kind of check out a bit. Being a little bathos heavy is a pretty consistent criticism I have with this franchise, and in this case, it definitely kind of deflates what I thought had been a much better climax up to that point. The issues I have with it don't stop it from being a great movie, but it does prevent it from being my personal favorite of the trilogy. I'll give credit where credit is due. Madagascar, Escape to Africa, is easily DreamWorks' best bad movie. Unlike the first one, this actually has a few things going for it. It's got the opening plane scene, which is funny. It's got the climactic plane scene, which is funny. And this one far more prominently features the penguins, who are funny. It's just a shame that there's a bunch of really boring and stupid plot that I don't care about in between the funny bits. Of the three main subplots in this movie, the weird interspecies love triangle between Gloria, Melman the Virgin Giraffe, and Moto Moto the Chad Male Hippo was probably the least bad one. Like, at least it made sense, you could see what message they were going for, and stupid scenes are so stupid that they're kind of funny. Then there's the subplot about Alex finding his parents, but he doesn't fit in with the other lions because he prefers dancing to fighting. 
A lot of people seem to read this as a gay analogy, and if that was the intention, I think it's a good example of why these bigotry analogies where the outcast has to prove themselves to the bigot just do not work. Like, the way this conflict is resolved is they contrive a scenario where Alex's ability to dance is what saves the day. Like, how would that work with the metaphor stripped away? Not to mention, this is the subplot that contains the vast majority of the most annoying scenes in the movie. The joke with Alex in every scene is that he just acts like a total man-child, and it gets grating really quickly. Finally, there's the subplot where Marty finds out that he looks, sounds, and acts identical to literally every other zebra, and I'm gonna be honest, I don't get this one. Like, he finds this out and gets upset because of it, then he gets upset at his friend for getting another zebra mixed up with him, but then his friend is able to pick him out of a crowd, and it's later revealed that he was able to do this because he has a scar on his butt from the time he bit him in the previous movie. I know I made this joke already, but was the movie running short? What were they even going for with this one? If you want the ideal Madagascar 2 experience, just try and find some supercut of all the scenes that the penguins are in, and maybe throw in the Moto Moto introduction scene, and that's it. I was not expecting much from Monsters vs. Aliens. Looking at the post- okay, I'm not doing this joke again. But seriously, while there are some that I found more actively annoying, this might be the movie in this marathon that I got the least out of. It really just feels like they were on autopilot for this one, because it's just a hodgepodge of reused elements from their previous movies. It's got the message about acceptance lifted right from Shrek, it's got the unfunny reference humor lifted right from Shark Tale, and the missing link is just fucking Moto Moto as a fish man instead of a hippo. And then there's the villain, who is, no exaggeration, maybe the worst in any DreamWorks movie. If he just had no motivation and they left it at that, that would have been one thing, but they go out of their way to say that he has a motivation, and then play off not explaining it as a joke. Except the joke isn't funny. So you're just left with him being one of the most nothing characters in history, and the movie making absolute sure you know it. Finally, this might be their ugliest movie. I don't know if it was done this way on purpose as part of the joke, like, who are these hard-looking creatures to be scared of the main characters? That is the only explanation I can think of for why they look so bad. This is already pretty near the bottom of my ranking, and I'm still thinking I may have overrated it. I guess there were a couple of jokes that were kind of funny, maybe, whatever, I'm done talking about this one. Oh, you can tell this is a somewhat more serious movie because it's the first time in like four movies that the DreamWorks logo kid didn't get beat up. The How to Train Your Dragon series was kind of DreamWorks critical darling for the 2010s. They were the ones that did well critically, they were the ones that DreamWorks fans would all gush over, they were the ones that would get nominated for Best Animated Feature and actually stand a semi-realistic chance at winning, and yeah, I like them. None of them make my personal top five or anything, but I think they're all good. Of the three of them, this one is probably my favorite, largely because this one is the most focused. Just a simple, endearing friendship story with an absolutely incredible score. Like, seriously, just like the plague scene in The Prince of Egypt. While this may not be a 10 out of 10 movie, that is absolutely a 10 out of 10 score. I think the main thing that holds me back from liking this franchise more are generally the things that aren't Hiccup, Toothless, and maybe a few other characters. I'm really not too big a fan of most of the supporting cast. The only real purpose most of them serve is comic relief, and I don't really find most of them that funny. Honestly, I'm not even that big a fan of the stuff with his dad in this movie. Them just not seeing eye to eye would be one thing, but the entire time he barely even acknowledges that Hiccup is saying anything. And when they reconcile at the end, it feels like it happens just because that's the part of the movie where it normally happens. The parts focused on learning about dragons, bonding with dragons, flying on dragons with that amazing score playing, that's what I really like in these movies. The other bits are just serviceable to me. Across virtually every review site, Shrek Forever After has similar scores to Shrek the Third, as if the two of them are on the same level, when like, no. 
Shrek the Third could just be erased from existence and literally nothing would change, but while it's nowhere near as good as the first two, the fourth one actually has some merit. I briefly touched on it earlier, but this one actually remembers what the point of Shrek was, going back to basing its plot around a subversion of the classic fairy tale formula, and also expanding upon the themes of the previous movies. Basically, the premise is that Shrek's story is kind of over. He's living his happily ever after. So, starting in a similar place to Shrek 2, except now the external adversity, which served as the main conflict in that movie, is pretty much dealt with. Instead, the main conflict revolves around Shrek's own personal biases about the type of person he's supposed to be. He used to be so sure of himself back when he was just a big scary ogre. And being this beloved figure that people aren't scared of anymore, and also dealing with mundane things like family responsibility, just doesn't feel right to him in terms of how things should be. Over time, he grows more and more frustrated with it, eventually lashing out, and being tempted to make a Faustian deal so he can spend a day in an alternate timeline, where none of the unorthodox fairy tale events of the previous movies ever happened. When things made sense, as he words it in the movie, and it basically becomes an it's a wonderful life type story. I think this setup is pretty good, and allows plenty of opportunity for Shrek to relearn how important it was for him and the people around him that the events of the previous movies happened. I definitely wouldn't normally go into that much detail about the themes of a movie that I don't even think is great, I just think it's alright. I really just felt like I had to make it clear that, despite not being great, Shrek 4 does work as a Shrek sequel on some level, while the third one just doesn't. All that being said, this movie does have plenty of issues, probably the biggest one being that for large chunks of the movie, Shrek himself is kind of an unlikable, irritating character. I'm not talking about the beginning, that's obviously intentional. I'm mainly talking about this stretch in the middle where he tries to romance the alternate universe version of Fiona. He honestly comes across as a total creep for a lot of it. And even in the parts where he doesn't, he still often feels bizarrely out of character. It makes their re-romance a much harder sell for me, and it's kind of a shame that it's so lackluster around this middle section because the last few scenes in the AU contain what are probably some of the best moments these characters have together in the entire series. This one also just isn't as funny as the first two. I get this one is trying to have a somewhat more serious tone than the previous ones, but when it does attempt humor, its success rate is considerably lower. It should be made clear that, even if Shrek 3 was ignored and this was considered the third movie, it would definitely still be a drop-off in terms of quality from the first two, but in no way should it be considered comparable in quality to Shrek 3. Megamind is decent. When I originally finished up this marathon, I posted my ranking on Reddit, and this was easily the movie that people were most upset about not being ranked higher. This is kind of in a weird place for me because... I do like this movie. It's funny. A cartoonish supervillain having an existential crisis is a pretty clever premise. I can see why people find some lines in this movie so quotable. It's not even like there's a lot I especially dislike about it. It's mostly just some gripes with the romance and how it uses the liar revealed trope in a pretty cliche way, and also I do think the visual style of the movie is mostly kind of bland. But those aren't fatal flaws that are preventing me from ranking it higher, they're just moderate criticisms that I could love a movie in spite of. In fact, I have criticisms like that for most of the movies I've ranked above it. It's a lot more that it just doesn't click with me quite as much. It's funny, but there's other DreamWorks movies I find funnier. Titan's a decent villain, being basically what would happen if you gave an incel superpowers, but there are a lot of other DreamWorks villains that I like better. And it has a fairly well-delivered message, but... Well, I think you get the pattern by now. I like this movie, just not one of my personal favorites. <music> Kung Fu Panda 2. Just rocks. Simple as. Of course, on a technical side, everything that made the first movie great is also great in this one, so let's get into why I think this one outperforms the original. As well as nearly every other DreamWorks movie. Firstly, this is easily the one of the trilogy where I think Poe is the best protagonist. I think in this one, they strike a great balance between him and the Furious Five in terms of skill level, where he's actually a somewhat competent member of the team while still obviously being by far the least experienced, and his arc in this movie about coming to terms with his traumatic past is so well presented, and concludes very satisfyingly. He is Poe, and what that means is not defined by the horrible way things started out for him, 
It's defined by whatever he chooses. Then there's the villain. Lord Shen is easily a candidate for my favorite DreamWorks villain. There's only one who might surpass him, one that's probably pretty obvious, who I'll get into later. I love his design, I love Gary Oldman's voice performance, and he does a great job representing the opposite philosophy, frequently taking advantage of Poe's conflicted, half-obsession, half-denial relationship he has with his past in order to mess with him and gain the upper hand. It also shows in his own character too. He also spends the movie basing his actions largely on an event from his past, one he clearly has some trauma of his own over, but unlike Poe, he consistently doubles down at every opportunity to confront himself over this. Because of course he would, an arrogant warmonger who was willing to commit actual genocide over his fear of a prophecy isn't going to be convinced by a lost battle and a polite conversation. It's only in his final moments before his eventual demise when he finally seems to accept things for how they really are, and he's quite literally killed by his own creation. And yeah, they include those parallels I mentioned without spelling it out by having the villain give a cheesy, you and I are not so different speech. Is there anything I dislike about this movie? I guess there's one minor plot contrivance that annoys me a little, and a few jokes that don't really land, but I think those are near completely overshadowed by just how much this movie does right. Holy shit, am I seriously only halfway through? My throat hurts. Maybe 45 movies was a bit tall in order for my first time ever doing a video like this. Oh well, I'm committed at this point. Puss in Boots is probably the most fine movie I've talked about so far in this marathon. I don't really feel too strongly about it either way. The look of the movie is alright, the humor is alright. I'm not even that bothered by that egg that everyone seems to hate. And the story is a very standard treasure hunting action adventure fair. There was an outlaw protagonist, there was an ex-partner he has a bad history with, there was a one last job, there was a double cross, and there was a woman. The latter isn't a problem, especially. A lot of DreamWorks good movies have fairly generic plots when you strip them down to their bare elements and get by on the execution being really good. The problem is mostly... puss. A lot of this movie plays out with the assumption that this character has... a lot more going on than he really does. I did like puss in the Shrek movies, but... he never really had a lot to him, did he? He was a fairly gimmicky supporting character who remained pretty static across all three movies he was in. And in this movie... His backstory basically winds up boiling down to, he was tricked, and that's why he's an outlaw. Man, no wonder Kitty fell asleep while he was telling that story. It may not have instantly made the movie great, but giving Puss something to him definitely would have been a massive step in the right direction. Say maybe he wasn't just tricked. Say he really was tempted to go into crime and maybe tried to abuse his, at the time, highly respected status to get away with it. Two boots. Once, a symbol of honor. Moments like that might actually have had some impact if maybe Puss really did betray this guy's trust. But instead, we're just watching a static character tell a backstory where he had no real active involvement, get told off for things that he didn't actually do, and then decide at the end of the movie to just continue doing what he'd pretty much already been doing. Yeah, it's pretty easy to see why the next Puss in Boots movie wasn't really much of a follow-up to this one. Honestly, I'm shocked. Madagascar 3 is good. I had heard that this one was the best of the trilogy from a few people, but I assumed best really meant marginally the most tolerable. The movie starts with a similarly comedic action scene to the one in the second movie, and while I was watching it, I was thinking, okay, this is fun for now, but eventually the actual plot is gonna start, and it's just gonna be boring. But then the craziness just kinda kept going. I think the keystone that makes this movie work is the villain, Captain Chantal Dubois. Unlike douchebag Alec Baldwin Lion from the second movie, or did the first movie even have a villain? Not only is she actually funny, but she looms as this constant threat. Whenever they get to a new setting, they only have so much time before she forces them to move on again. So they spend their limited time doing funny stuff instead of wasting it with boring drama that no one cares about. Probably the closest thing they have to a dramatic plotline is the thing with the tiger being disgraced by an act gone wrong in the past, but what his act actually is is so ridiculous that I know I'm saying this word way too much today, but it's just hilarious. 
Honestly, this has basically just been one long way of saying that they took the parts of the second movie that worked and pretty much just made that the entire movie. It's all either total manic action or just so stupid that it's funny. Unfortunately, they do still throw in the lie-revealed second to third act fallout thing, and it's terrible in this movie. It's so pointless and forced in that it genuinely may have brought the movie down a point for me. Seriously though, if you're ever gonna watch a Madagascar movie, watch this one. I'm not annoyed by Rise of the Guardians, particularly, it's just kinda dumb. The concept is that a bunch of characters like Santa Claus and Easter Bunny have some sort of Avengers force called the Guardians, and the main character is Jack Frost. His arc is that when he starts out, well, he's a bit of a trickster, all around he's a good, fun-loving guy. And then he loses confidence and his magic staff is broken. But then he has a flashback and learns that, well, he's a bit of a trickster, all around he's a good, fun-loving guy. And I guess also he saved his sister once, or something. And then he fixes his staff and regains his self-confidence about 20 seconds after he lost them. I think they were going for a similar message to the one in Kung Fu Panda 2, but it just doesn't come across nearly as well delivered to me. I'm never fully sold on this weird concept. The humor isn't that funny whenever they attempt it. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the character and creature designs. They try and design them to be cooler than they're traditionally portrayed, but it often just comes across as pretty try-hard. And I don't find the characters that engaging. They even give the villain a cheesy, you and I are not so different speech in this one. You know, the very thing I praised Kung Fu Panda 2 for not doing. If the parallels are there and are relevant, they should be noticeable without the villain having to spell it out. It's not the worst, it's just not for me. Okay, I take back what I said about Puss in Boots. This is the most fine movie I've talked about so far. Like, what is there to say, even? It's pretty much a family road trip movie, it's got Nicolas Cage and Emma Stone playing cavemen, and it's got everyone's favorite Ryan Reynolds playing the straight man. And it makes all the exact sorts of jokes you would expect them to make in a movie about a smart guy and a strong guy butting heads, and the smart one is also a love interest for the strong one's daughter. I'm not kidding, that's... Seriously, all I have to say about this one. It's fine, it's what it says on the tin. There's not a lot that makes it stand out in a good way, but there's also not much to outright dislike. I don't particularly recommend it, but I don't particularly recommend avoiding it either. It has a slight nostalgic factor for me because I watched it a few times as a kid, but other than that, to me, it just kinda... exists. Let me tell you about my experience watching Turbo. I was watching on a borrowed DVD that wasn't in the best condition. As a result, the movie buffered a bit, and once or twice it fully crashed. When I'd eventually gotten over halfway through the movie, I had pretty much fully decided that if it crashed one more time, I seriously wasn't even going to bother finishing the movie, because I was so fucking bored. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, that didn't happen, and I ended up having to sit all the way through Turbo. Easily the worst movie I've talked about so far. I don't know if I've ever been so utterly uninterested in engaging with a movie. In most of the other DreamWorks movies I've ranked really low down, there's at least some attempt at making things semi-entertaining. Like, you could at least point to a basic plot structure, or some parts that are attempting to be funny even if they're failing. Turbo has nothing. Plot is that the main character gets superpowers, and then everything goes totally perfect for him the rest of the movie. Eventually, they realize that the main character has faced absolutely no adversity and that there are no stakes in the upcoming race which is supposed to serve as the climax of the movie, so last minute they throw in a twist villain to try and provide the illusion that either of those things are present. I mean, I wasn't on the writing team for this movie, I don't know if that's the exact way the writing process played out, but that's definitely how it comes across, because he has no impact whatsoever on the plot and doesn't impact the main character's arc in any way. Of course, that's partially due to the fact that the main character doesn't even have an arc, but it's kind of hard to learn anything when you get handed everything you wanted at the start of the movie, and it turns out to be everything you dreamed it would be. Maybe it would be fine if the plot wasn't the focus and they were just trying to be funny, but they're not. The only attempt at a joke I even remember is that god-awful Snail is Fast remix that was clearly trying to pander to internet culture at the time. 
As awful as that was, I kind of wish the movie had more stuff like that. At least then I probably would have been less bored. Over the Hedge may have been the biggest surprise overall in this marathon, but Mr. Peabody and Sherman was definitely the biggest negative surprise. I definitely was not expecting to dislike this movie as much as I did. The three main characters in this have to be one of the most unendearing trios you could possibly put in a movie like this. The titular Mr. Peabody is probably the least annoying, not that that's saying much. I really don't like his weird monotone mid-Atlantic voice. It makes scenes that are trying to convey any sort of emotion just about impossible to take seriously. I suppose there's also the thing that this character is supposed to be best known for, his intelligence. They try and play it up like he's really smart and observant, but it usually just comes across like he's totally omniscient. Maybe this would work pretty well if they played it for comedy, but the only point in the movie I can think of where they do happens late in the runtime and is brushed past pretty quickly. In most scenes, I don't know what I'm supposed to feel when they wind up in some situation, but Mr. Peabody just happens to know some random factoid that gets them out of it. So I usually just end up feeling pretty bored. Also, gotta love how his ability just goes away whenever they need to force some drama. As for the two kids, they're just useless. The boy is just kind of there to be dumb and repeat this interaction in every scene. That's amazing. It's not amazing. It was just a matter of keeping my head. <laughs> keeping your head up. I don't get it. That could be mildly charming if it were just a one-off, but as a recurring gag, it gets really irritating. And the girl is just there to be an asshole to the boy, cause literally every single conflict, and then, completely out of nowhere, be a love interest? This has to be one of the worst, most forced-in romantic subplots I have ever seen in a movie. Even if the characters weren't, what, six? The only interaction they even had before the movie suddenly starts treating them like they're a thing is her holding him by the neck and him biting her to get her off. Then there's the plot these characters are put through, which is just... nonsense. At the start, the conflict is that Mr. Peabody could lose custody of Sherman, the boy, because of the aforementioned bite. Then the movie just completely forgets about this and they screw around in random past time periods for an hour. Then they get back, there's a rip in the space-time continuum, or whatever term they use for it in this movie. Mr. Peabody talks a bunch of nonsense as a solution. And then they remember the custody conflict and resolve it by getting a presidential pardon from George Washington, then sending the evil social worker to the Shadow Realm. I'm pretty sure that whole last section is already kind of known for being pretty bad, even among people who like the movie, and I didn't even like the movie before that point. Are there any funny parts, at least? I guess there's that one point earlier where Mr. Peabody kind of self-acknowledges that he's basically invincible. Patrick Warburton is in it for like two minutes, and I guess he's alright. Yeah, that's about it. The rest of the jokes are the most obvious, tired ones you could possibly make about each time period they go to, and I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of them were directly lifted from the original 50s cartoon. How to Train Your Dragon 2 is, in many ways, a solid follow-up to the first movie. The animation and character design remain great, I like that this is one of the few animated franchises that actually noticeably ages the main characters in the sequels. The music remains great, Hiccup and Toothless are still endearing, and I actually prefer the stuff with Hiccup's parents in this one to that of the first, largely because some actual communication goes on in this one. And it has a good place about Hiccup's arc throughout the trilogy about deciding the kind of person he wants to be. It's mainly some plot elements which prevent me from liking this one quite as much as the first. This might be a bit of a hot take, this character seems kind of popular, but I don't think Drago's a very good villain. I think his design and his voice performance are good, but in terms of his character and what he actually represents thematically, I honestly think he's pretty weak. His motivation doesn't really come across as any different from any of the other dragon-hating humans in this franchise, and this may sound a little weird, but sometimes I think movies can have a problem with making their villain too threatening. Drago has the unwavering loyalty of a giant dragon, and that dragon has the seemingly limitless ability to mind control other dragons. Power of friendship can often feel like a pretty cheap way to resolve a conflict, but in this corner they wrote themselves into, I don't really know what else they possibly could have done. When the villain is eventually defeated, it doesn't particularly feel like he was outmaneuvered, or that his ideology lost because it was inherently flawed in some way. It kind of just feels like, good wins because it's good. 
Still a good movie overall, but definitely the weakest of the trilogy in my eyes. Penguins of Madagascar kind of starts off with a similar problem to the Puss in Boots movie, where you're trying to write a character, or in this case, a group of characters, who were only ever created for a comedic supporting role as the protagonists. In fact, they're actually probably starting off in a considerably more difficult position with this one, because Puss was at least written as a somewhat friendlier, more approachable character, while with the Penguins, the comedy tended to come from the fact that they're total psychopaths who are completely disconnected from reality. So what they end up doing is re-characterizing and slightly redesigning the Penguins to more closely resemble their counterparts from the Penguins of Madagascar TV show. Even though I don't think that show is canon to the movies. I mean, it can't be. It would have to take place between the second and third movies, and that doesn't make any sense on the- t Why do I care? As it turns out, I actually used to watch that show as a kid, and this movie does largely feel like an episode of that show extended to feature length. The show was always a lot more openly fantastical, having premises and plot beats that would feel really weird and out of place in the movies, and of course, the Penguins act a lot more like the stereotypical main cast of a children's TV show. Having them be more protagonisty and relatable than they were in their previous movie appearances may have made sense from a marketing perspective, but it makes them less funny. It also doesn't help that the plot of this movie isn't even funny stupid, it's just stupid stupid. This octopus wants to make penguins less cute so people don't like them anymore, so he invents this serum that makes things ugly, and there's also technology that can, like, extract cuteness from things and put it onto other things. You see what I mean when I say more openly fantastical. And then it tries to end on a looks don't matter message, even though everything else that happens in the movie suggests complete opposite, including the fate of the villain literally immediately afterwards. Also, kind of funny that to play the straight man in a movie about penguins, they got an actor who famously can't even pronounce the word. Let's have a look. Listen carefully. And the last thing you might expect to see here is penguins. Personally, I think I'll stick with Madagascar 3. Come on, I wanna dance in the dark. I'm not even gonna sugarcoat it. This is the worst movie that I watched in this entire marathon. You've got Jim Parsons, and he is playing Sheldon Cooper Alien. He speaks in supposedly cutesy broken English. You've got Rihanna, and she is playing herself, pretty much. They are looking for Rihanna's mom, played by Jennifer Lopez, and also running away from Badger from Breaking Bad Alien, and annoying comedic actor who was popular 30 to 40 years ago Alien. And they speak in this same supposedly cutesy broken English, complete with potty humor, much of which is directly recycled from their older bad movies, references to memes that were already really outdated when the movie came out, let alone today, all set to a Rihanna and Jennifer Lopez soundtrack. Yeah, that's right, Rihanna and Jennifer Lopez both play characters in this movie and also have their songs playing in the background, because that's not jarring at all. At one point, Rihanna's character turns on the radio, and a Rihanna song is playing on the radio, in-universe. Did these two produce this movie under pseudonyms just as a promotion vehicle for their music? You know in Everything Everywhere All at Once, how there's an infinite multiverse and literally everything that is conceivable, there's some universe out there where it just exists? I reckon I found something that would be an exception. There is absolutely no way there is a universe out there where a movie that can accurately be described in the above manner could possibly be good. Just giving the movie a relatively objective description already makes it sound awful, and as for the execution, I will concede. There was one joke in the entire movie that I liked. The scene where Sheldon Cooper Alien finds a cookbook and then cooks the book, and the movie doesn't stop to explain it, it lets you figure out the joke on your own, that brief sight gag was moderately funny. The rest of it is just, what do you even want me to say? That it's bad? Of course it's bad. I don't know if there's a single character out there more uncreative in terms of how they play them for comedy than Sheldon Cooper Alien. He doesn't understand human objects, he takes things literally, and he says things weird. That is the joke with him in every scene. Can people not think of any other way to characterize an alien? And then at some points in the movie, they try and have some emotional moments, but throughout these scenes, he's still talking in that same nonsense asinine way with that same Sheldon Cooper voice. Rihanna is just there to be terrible at voice acting, and kind of be a straight man? I guess it's not a buddy road trip movie without a buddy, so they needed someone. 
Then there's how things conclude with the sort of main villain, which I think is meant to be some kind of emotional core for the movie. I don't even want to talk about the twist, because it was so obvious that I'm questioning if it was even meant to be a twist, but it all builds up to this resolution where Sheldon Cooper alien gives him back his egg. Throughout the scene, the main character and the other guy are just speaking nonsense babble, which is meant to be an alien language, and then after the whole scene plays out, they stop the movie and have Sheldon Cooper alien give a recap explaining the entire scene. Like, is that the bar you've set with the audience you expect to be watching this? People who can't even understand the extremely basic visual storytelling going on in that last scene. So you have to stop the movie and have one of the characters give a complete play-by-play -play explanation of the scene immediately afterwards. There is no other movie in this marathon that feels more like it was made for actual babies than this one. Not even the one with baby in the name. Which, um, I guess we'll get to soon. Kung Fu Panda 3 is easily the weakest of the trilogy. Keep in mind, this is the weakest Kung Fu Panda movie we're talking about here, so that still puts it higher than the vast majority of other DreamWorks movies. Ho himself has a little less going on in this one. He does still have some scenes focused on him, but it also largely starts to be about the effect he has on people around him. Which I actually think is a pretty good approach to take, with the whole student becoming the master thing they're going for. Also, this is the one where Mr. Ping plays the biggest role in the story, which is definitely a plus for me. They properly introduce Poe's biological father in this one as well, and while Poe has some good scenes with him, I actually think my favorite scenes with the bio dad are the ones between him and Mr. Ping. There's just something I like about two different dads bonding over their son. However, there's a pretty crucial element to a Kung Fu Panda movie that I haven't talked about yet. One that I would consider to be easily the best part of each of the last two movies. Some people have their gripes with the whole panda village. Personally, I'm pretty indifferent about it. For me, easily the thing that makes this the weakest Kung Fu Panda movie is that the villain just isn't that good. He's basically this franchise's Drago. His design is good. I think J.K. Simmons was great casting. And he's actually got a pretty great theme as well. That's actually one consistently great thing in this franchise that I haven't even mentioned before now is the music. But Kai's characterization is pretty weak. At the start of the movie, there's a running joke that no one even knows who he is, when a large part of what made Tai Lung and Lord Shen so great was the connection they had with one or more of the main characters. We eventually learn that he was a friend-turned-enemy of Uguay's about 500 years earlier, and he's seemingly motivated by revenge on Uguay for banishing him and erasing him from history. We don't really get that great an idea regarding what actually happened between them. He was Uguay's most trusted, lifelong friend one moment, than his mortal enemy the next. He turned evil because he wanted chi, I guess? He hardly even seems erased from history, they quite easily find a scroll of Uguay's detailing all of this. It almost feels like I'm building up to a reveal that there was actually more to the story. Like, maybe the cast finds out this person they idolized had a shadier side to him at one point. But that never happens, it's just that simplistic. Also, continuing with the Drago comparisons, he has a similar problem of being a bit too threatening, and as a result, his defeat does feel pretty Deus Ex Machina. And if he does have any strong thematic connections to the story, they're kinda lost on me. This third movie is still decent overall, but when that fourth one eventually comes out, I hope they use the opportunity to end this series on a somewhat stronger note. Ugh, mid-2010s to early 2020s DreamWorks is brutal. Every time there's a slight ray of hope, it's always immediately followed by more shit. I was never going to like Trolls. I hate pop song covers. I hate how over-the-top cutesy everything is. It's try-hard like Rise of the Guardians, except at the complete opposite end of the spectrum. I hate that there's a troll that shits cake. I hate that there's another one that farts glitter and also screams in autotune. I hate that James Corden is in it. I hate the atrocious dialogue. I hate that it has possibly the worst twist villain I have ever seen in any movie. It's like they just put all the troll characters on a roulette wheel and decided that whichever one it landed on would be the one that turns traitor. At least you get to die with a clear conscience. So, in a way, you could say, I'm doing this for you. Like, who the fuck even are you again? I think he said namaste a few times earlier. Honestly, my favorite scenes in the movie are probably the ones with these stupid grundle things. Is that what they're called? 
I don't remember, and I don't really care to check. These scenes are still really bad, but at least in them, everything isn't constantly singing awful pop songs. The only time I can think of in the movie where they sing is really weird. At one point, it cuts to the Grundle Village, and they're all singing Clint Eastwood by Gorillaz. Why are they all singing a song about being high? Is it seriously just because it contains the lyrics, I ain't happy? The fact that this movie isn't at the very bottom of my ranking has very little to do with any redeeming quality it has, and far more to do with just how bad some of the others are. And, of course, it has a sequel, so I can't even take solace in the fact that I'm done talking about it. The only thing I sort of like about The Boss Baby is that it's almost kind of endearing in its shittiness. They actually took this stupid fucking idea and put far, far more effort into it than it deserves. I didn't read the book this is based on, but I had a look at the plot synopsis on the Boss Baby wiki, which apparently exists, and this whole bizarre lore they came up with where there's a secret company run by hyper-intelligent babies, where they monitor the distribution of all the world's love and try to make sure babies are always in demand, and send out field agents to pose as regular babies in order to do undercover work, and they drink this anti-aging formula to stay babies forever. To my knowledge, none of that is in the book. They just came up with all of that, and then decided to make a $125 million movie about it. Who in this movie's target audience is all of that for? Why does this analogy go any deeper than the baby just being a boss because babies are demanding? Because at the end of the day, this is still just a really standard, lowbrow family movie that I can't see anyone other than really young kids and particularly uncritical parents enjoying. Because it's too, for lack of better words, stupid and annoying for everyone else. I guess I should talk about what happens in the movie. So, basically there's this annoying bratty kid who I think is supposed to be relatable, and a boss baby shows up at his house because apparently he has to stop their parents' boss, creator former boss baby Steve Buscemi, from removing all demand for babies by creating immortal puppies. If you haven't seen this movie, I know that sounds stupid even by bad DreamWorks standards, but I promise that really is the plot. Along the way, there's a lot of baby butt, a lot of drool, some characters that only seem to be in the movie because the director's nephew really wanted to show off his famous Gandalf and Elvis impressions, and another character who was literally just Rico from the Penguins of Madagascar movie, same voice actor and everything. There's also a second to third act follow, and I feel like I keep saying this right now about different parts of each movie, but it may be the worst one I have ever seen. It just happens totally out of nowhere, and then, no exaggeration, it is over with in 55 seconds. Boss Baby just walks away, and then walks back, and then the fallout is over and the movie continues. Why even have it, then? Also, fuck this movie for containing possibly the worst three-second sequence of sound and visuals ever in anything, including real life. Like, it's so awful that I don't even want to play the clip in this video. If you really need to see it for yourself, it happens during the preparation montage around 42 minutes and 40 seconds into the movie. Another one I don't really feel that strongly about. I never read any of the Captain Underpants books as a kid, so I can't really speak to how good this was as an adaptation. As a standalone movie, it was just fine. There are some mildly funny jokes. That song Weird Al made for it is actually pretty good. I just think I'm kind of out of the target age demographic for this movie. The whole plot and all of the humor is based around the sorts of things that young kids find funny. That's not a criticism, necessarily. That's kind of the entire point, right down to what ends up being the emotional core of the movie. It just doesn't really speak to me personally. I more just appreciate it for showing that it's possible to make a movie with this kitty, potty humor sort of appeal that isn't total shit. You know, unlike many of the other DreamWorks movies from this era. I guess all that's left to talk about is the animation. It's fine. Even without the self-aware jokes they make about it, it'd probably be pretty easy to tell that the budget of this movie was quite low for a CG animated movie, but they managed to find a style that isn't really hurt by the lack of detail or polish. It's not a masterpiece, but it's easily the best non-sequel they've made since... 2010. Wow, we're on a bad streak. You and I, we be How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World, is a solid conclusion to a solid trilogy. 
I don't think it's quite as good as the first, but it's definitely better than the second, and I do think my preference there mainly comes down to the villain. Grimmel does tread a lot of familiar ground with Drago from the second one, but while his design and voice are definitely far less memorable, I do end up preferring him overall largely because when he takes the upper hand, he comes across more as competent and less ludicrously overpowered, and when he's defeated, it does come across more like he was outmaneuvered and his ideology was flawed, and less like a deus ex machina. It also does a lot that works really well in a finale. There are some pretty cool callbacks to the first movie, and it takes a leaf out of the Last Crusades book and saves the series' iconic main theme for one triumphant use just after the climax. I also do find the side characters a bit less annoying by this one. I don't know if any of them progressed to the point of being likable for me, but maybe one or two of them came kind of close. I don't know. I have heard the Netflix shows give these characters more to them. Maybe I'd like these movies more if I watched them, but I'm already watching 45 movies. I'm not watching nearly 120 episodes of TV on top of that. And that's it. How to Train Your Dragon never really reached the same heights that DreamWorks' other two flagship franchises have, in my opinion, but I liked it all the way through. At the time this came out, I wasn't left with much faith in the future of DreamWorks. It seemed like Shrek had run its course, and the fifth one they kept teasing just didn't seem like it would ever come out, and it still hasn't. How to Train Your Dragon had ended, and at the time Kung Fu Panda had seemingly also ended, so it looked like we were just going to be left with Trolls and the Boss Baby as the new faces of DreamWorks. Guess we'll just have to see how that turned out. I was expecting this one to be boring. I was not expecting it to be this boring. This definitely competes with Flushed Away and Monsters vs. Aliens for being the one that I got the least out of, because there are few, if any, movies in this marathon that are more yawn-inducingly conventional than this one. Some kids find a cutesy mythical creature and help it escape from some mercenaries. There's another terrible twist villain in this one. First, you're led to believe that the old rich guy is the mercenary one, and the British scientist woman is the altruistic one, but it turns out the old rich guy is the altruistic one, and the scientist woman is the mercenary one. And also, she was only pretending to be British. I really don't know why the guy she was trying to fool didn't know who she was anyway. It's genuinely completely pointless. The kids find out before they even properly interact with her. Why is it even a reveal? And that's really all there is to this one. Pointless villain side plot aside, you pretty much get the same experience watching this movie as you do from looking at the poster. Mm. <laughs> Why does Trolls get a sequel? I don't want to talk about this fucking franchise anymore. It's just the same shit as the first one again. They repeat a lot of the same jokes, the same try-hard cutiness with all the same annoying characters. We get to see the glitter-shitting one reproduce, because that's something I really wanted to see. And it has, somehow, an even worse soundtrack. They use Gangnam Style and Party Rocking in a movie that came out in the 2020s. This time, the plot is that it turns out there's a different type of troll for every genre of music, and everyone hates the main characters who are the pop trolls because they're always stealing from the other genres. Like, it's obviously supposed to be a commentary on cultural appropriation. If you're gonna try and win your movie some points by including social commentary, at least have it not suck. Of course, the resolution they come to is, every genre should be allowed to mix, but then the final song, which is awful, by the way. It goes on for what feels like 10 minutes, and it's just the same three lines on repeat. It's all just pop, and the other genres get like two bars each. And why am I putting so much thought into this? It's trolls too, they don't care if it's good or not. I guess there's also these rock trolls that are trying to steal all the music. They build this up like it's the main conflict, but then halfway through the third act, they kind of just forget about it in favor of the other one I just talked about. There's other stuff in this movie I dislike that I could talk about, but what's the point? It's Trolls 2. I was never going to like it. I hate that this franchise is so successful because it just means they're going to keep making more movies for it. There's a third one coming out this year as I'm recording this, and I need to make absolute sure this video comes out before that movie does, because I really don't want to be forced to tack Trolls 3 onto the end of my video. Okay. It's not like the first Croods was terrible, but was anybody asking for a follow-up? I didn't realize it apparently left a big enough cultural impact for them to go back and make a sequel seven years after the fact. 
I have similarly little to say about this one. This time, the story is that they meet a family of modern humans, and, again, they make all the sorts of jokes you would expect them to make about cave people and modern humans butting heads. And also, the modern family wants the modern human from the first one to hook up with their daughter instead of the cave girl. I guess there are a few particulars to point out. The modern human from the first one has a pet sloth, and the modern family in this one also has a pet sloth, who is a girl and the two of them are literally just the embodiment of this meme, they were possibly even the inspiration for it. I guess the monkeys who have an entire language built around punching were kinda funny, and also there's this one bizarre moment where the two dads have a bonding moment, and the music they play is weirdly sensual. But those are all just small things. In general, if you like the first one, you'll like this one. If you didn't like the first one, you won't like this one. I was pretty indifferent to the first one, so I'm pretty indifferent to this one. Maybe slightly more towards negative. There were a lot of cliché argument scenes. Oh, what even is this? So, to the best I can figure out, there is a spirit TV show on Netflix, and this movie is a prequel to it, I think. I have absolutely no idea how it relates to the 2002 spirit movie, if it does at all. Is it a sequel? Is it a reboot? Is it a remake? I don't know. And even ignoring the fact that it's a spin-off to a Netflix show no one watches, why was this released in theaters? This has to have some of the cheapest looking animation and some of the worst voice acting I've ever seen in a theatrical animated movie. It looks and sounds like something of straight-to-DVD quality from the 2000s. Or a TV show, perhaps. Its budget wasn't very high, and yet I'm still wondering where most of that went. Captain Underpants' budget was barely higher, and that looked fine and had much better voice acting. The plot is abominable levels of boringly conventional. It even has pretty much the same story, except with a horse instead of a yeti. Whatever, man. Why am I still talking about this? Next movie. Okay. To be utterly fair to Boss Baby 2, most elements of this movie are not as bad as their counterparts in the first one. There's a new Boss Baby character in this one, and I like her marginally more than the Boss Baby character from the first one. I think the brothers from the first one are marginally better as characters in this one. There's another chase scene in this one, and honestly, it's a notable improvement. It's actually a somewhat funny chase scene. And there are far less baby butts. Really, the only thing that was a step down in quality compared to its counterpart in the first one was the villain. And the villain in the first one was fucking shit. He's played by Jeff Goldblum, and he clearly did not give a fuck while recording this. And the character ends up being way overanimated for the level of energy his performance brings. What are you doing? No, 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 Come on, man, you were probably paid more than most people were in a year for this. But, like, whatever, man. This is yet another one that's hard to talk about because it's so uninteresting. This post How to Train Your Dragon and Kung Fu Panda era is truly the company's worst one so far. This is the only movie that made me seriously consider defying the list of movies provided on DreamWorks' website. It's not even that it looked especially bad compared to many of the other movies I've talked about in this video, but more because it's a joint series finale to three different TV shows that are set in the same universe, so it seemed a bit wrong to jump right to the finale. In the end, I just said screw it and watched it anyway, and let's just say that seeing how it all ended definitely does not get me interested in going back and checking out the shows. Just to be clear though, it's not like I thought the movie was good before that point. The plot really isn't that complicated, but it's told in such a confusing way because of the sheer amount of characters they have to, I'm assuming, reintroduce at the beginning, most of whom really don't play much of an active role in the plot. They're just there because I guess everybody has to be there for the finale. Also, a lot of them, especially this kid, and even more especially the grass girl, are really, really annoying. Holy shit, I hate how she talks. Of course, both of these characters die over the course of the movie, and when it happens, I'm thinking, I get this is supposed to be sad, but that character was really annoying. And I end up just being happy that they're not going to be in the movie anymore after that. 
It's not exclusively those two, though, because while the rest of the characters don't make me want to tear my ears out whenever they talk, all of them are really stupid. They keep thinking they have the upper hand on the villains when it's blatantly obvious that they don't. Like, at one point, one of the characters is fighting one of the titular titans with a giant robot, and the main character is looking on all happy, like, this is actually gonna work. Dude, five minutes ago, you saw one of the titans get blown to smithereens, and it just regenerated itself. Why would this go any different? There's some other weird shit in this movie as well, like a really bizarre Mpreg subplot, but what we really need to talk about is that ending. It may not be the only reason I dislike the movie, but all things considered, it's easily the worst thing about it. After the climax happens and the villain is defeated, they introduce time travel completely out of nowhere. Like, again, I haven't seen any of the shows this is based on, but the characters do all act like it's a new thing when they find it. And what they choose to do with it is reset everything back to the beginning. And I don't even mean back to the beginning of the movie, I mean back to the very beginning of the first show. So everything that you just spent potentially dozens of hours watching, presuming you actually watched the shows, was completely pointless. Like, why? Their stated reason was to try and redo the events of the series, but correcting all the mistakes they made along the way? That is stupid. It is insulting to the people who liked what came before just to come along and say that none of it ever happened. I barely saw any of this series, and I didn't even like what I did see, and I still felt cheated. If anyone you happen to know is currently watching through any of the Tales of Arcadia shows, just tell them to come up with their own ending and not to bother with this movie. I can almost guarantee that whatever ending they come up with would be far better than the actual one they went with. Oh my god, finally, something good. Pretty good, to be clear. Not amazing, but The Bad Guys is an absolute masterpiece compared to the long streak of garbage that came before it. When I do the overall ranking, it might seem like I have this one a bit higher than it deserves because, yeah, it is a very flawed movie. A lot of it is just to do with how much I love this animation style. I love the color palette, I love how expressive the designs are, and I love the subtle comic book details like motion lines and visualized sound effects. And that's not to say that's all I liked about the movie. It was funny. I liked a lot of the character dynamics. Aside from a couple of... kinda bad jokes, I'd say probably the main thing holding me back from liking this movie more was... the villain. Now, to be utterly fair, this is easily the best time that DreamWorks has ever done a twist villain. I guess his role in the story is thematically appropriate, and he actually has a reason to be a twist villain instead of being revealed outright. However, everything about him is really on the nose, his plan is pretty stupid, and also his voice is annoying. I have to say though, this is easily the best non-sequel DreamWorks has made since How to Train Your Dragon back in 2010. The last decade was pretty rough for them, so hopefully this is a sign of things to come. I wonder what they'll do next. Holy shit. I know that everyone and their mother has already gone off about this, but really, they made a sequel to a mediocre spin-off that came out over a decade prior, and the result was easily one of the best animated movies I have ever seen. It takes Puss and turns him from that funny supporting character from Shrek 2 into easily the best, most nuanced protagonist this studio has ever produced really delving into how his outward, fearless hero persona affects him and the people around him. It takes Kitty, who was a relatively flat love interest character in the first movie, and made her not only important to Puss's arc, but allowed her to experience some self-reflection of her own. If I remember correctly, the first movie might have brought up at, like, one part that she had trust issues, maybe? But this is the movie that actually gives her an arc of her own about it. Forgive me because I cannot pronounce Spanish double R's, but even Perito, a character who at first seemed worryingly like he was just going to be annoying, proved to be funny, even if he was probably the most inconsistent character in that regard, to know to tone it down at the story's more serious moments, as well as to be an essential character for both Puss and Kitty's arcs. And Goldilocks' arc as well, they do a lot of good stuff with this character. Oh yeah, that's another thing. This movie is not long, but it balances 10 major characters for the entire runtime and somehow does it without feeling bloated or poorly paced. This movie has three villains, and they're all great. Goldilocks as the rival MacGuffin Hunter with a sympathetic angle. 
Jack Horner as the pure evil megalomaniac, who's also quite possibly the funniest villain in any DreamWorks movie. And Death, who is just the greatest thing ever. When I said earlier that there was only one character who probably beat out Lord Shen for being my very favorite DreamWorks villain, this is who I was referring to. I love his design, I love his voice, I love his demeanor, I love that he whistles his own theme, and I love what he represents thematically. Contrary to his name, he clearly really values life and despises people who don't. So seeing Puss throw away eight of them on arrogant, meaningless ventures while consistently walking away from any meaningful relationships he's had, yeah, I'd say that's a good enough reason for him to be as pissed at Puss as he is. The contrast between Puss's first and last interactions with him is incredible, and the conclusion to all of this, it's just beautiful. No other word for it. The character death is also a good segue into something else that's great about this movie. It brings back the edge from early DreamWorks. I don't even mean just humorous violence or more overt language than you would expect, although there is plenty of that. This is more like Prince of Egypt level of having some legitimately scary scenes, particularly involving you-know-who. And all of that isn't even mentioning the animation. Easily the best-looking movie DreamWorks has ever done. I'm not entirely certain why they decided to go this hard on a Shrek spin-off of all things, but Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, just came out of nowhere and ended up being, in my opinion, the best movie that this studio has ever made. And that conclu- Oh wait, hold on, there's still one more movie. On one hand, it's a bit disappointing that I didn't get this video made on time for things to end on a totally positive note, because Ruby Gilman isn't good, I'm afraid. On the other hand, this might actually be a more fitting way to end things off. DreamWorks got damn near unanimous praise for their output in 2022, and as fun as that was, I don't think that's a very accurate impression to be left with. We needed one last reminder that DreamWorks Animation Studios is not a masterpiece machine. Their output is a mixed bag. It has been since the very beginning. So, what is Ruby Gilman actually like? This might actually be news for some of you, because very few people saw this one, it was a pretty big bomb. Well, in many ways, it kind of returns to DreamWorks' roots, in that it's trying to emulate a recent Disney Pixar film, in this case, Turning Red. I guess someone at DreamWorks didn't get the memo that that hasn't been their business model since, like, 2005. I don't even just mean the conceptual similarity, in that it's also about a young girl who discovers that the women of her family have the ability to turn into a giant creature, and that she has to learn how to control this power, with a large portion of the plot being about generational family fallout. I mean, the whole tone, the school setting, the way characters talked, it's clearly trying to evoke a similar feeling. It just doesn't do it as well. For one, the character design just isn't that great in this movie, especially the humans. Some of them look fine, a lot of them look really ugly. It's also not that funny, either. I never found it grating, especially, but most of the humor was pretty played out. And the plot... The generational Fallout subplot is fine, the high school prom subplot could be plucked from any random Disney Channel original movie. And the solution to destroying the evil MacGuffin at the end is just... We have to use our laser eyes. We already tried that. It didn't work. We just have to do it more and harder. Okay. And that actually works. It's not awful. The IMDb and Letterboxd scores would have you believe it's one of DreamWorks' very worst. I'd put it more in the Crude's tier of just being really generic. And that is all 45 of DreamWorks Animation's feature films reviewed. All that is left to do now is rank them. These are the tiers I've made. I could have just done 1 to 10, but like, you know, whatever. If you want to see, like, my score out of 10 for each one, just look at my letterbox or something. These are just, like, one-word descriptors I could think of for each one. First off, we have Ants, and Ants is subpar. I was pretty confident about that. Uh, Prince of Egypt is great, though. That is a great movie. Road to El Dorado is good. I don't think this is a great movie. I think the kind of, like, re-evaluation that people have had for it is maybe a bit, like, overcompensating. Chicken Run is similar. It's just The Great Escape, but with chickens, and it's kind of funny. And it has really nice animation. Uh, next is The First Shrek. 
Uh, this also goes in great tier, above the Prince of Egypt. I said in the section of the video, Spirit, Stallion of the Cimarron, was the first one that I would consider mediocre. Sinbad. Do I put this above or below Ants? I think I put it above Ants, just because, like, the animation's better. Shrek 2 is our first amazing tier. I love this movie. It is so funny. It improves on the first one in just about every way. Uh, Shark Tale is awful. Like, I don't think it's quite in the worst tier, but it is a really just bad animated movie. Uh, Madagascar, the original, also awful. Like, the first one just sucks. Curse the Were Rabbit is great. But I love Wallace and Gromit, and this is probably my favorite Wallace and Gromit thing. So, Over the Hedge, this one's the one that I consider to be the biggest surprise of the whole marathon, and I'm wondering if I put it in the bottom of great tier or the top of good tier. I, I'm, I'll be generous and put it in the bottom of great tier. Like, it is a really surprisingly good movie. Um, Flushed Away is bad. Um, so next up, Greg the Third. Uh, do I put, I think I put it below Flushed Away, like, Shrek the Third, I cannot believe how bad that was compared to the first two. Uh, B-Movie is subpar. I, did I put it, do I put it above or below Ants? Like, this is really derivative events for some reason. Uh, Kung Fu Panda, the first one. Not my favorite Kung Fu Panda movie, but I put it above the Prince of Egypt. Madagascar 2. I said that this is DreamWorks' best bad movie. Monsters vs. Aliens, I think I... I'll... I'm putting it below, flushed away. Uh, How to Train Your Dragon, the first one. I put in great tier, like, around here. Uh, Shrek Forever After is still not that great compared to the first two, but... Like, at least, unlike the third one, it somewhat works as a Shrek sequel. Uh, Megamind is also good. I think I put it here. Uh, Kung Fu Panda 2. Amazing. I love Kung Fu Panda 2. Like, this was my favorite DreamWorks movie for a long time. Puss in Boots, the original, is mediocre. Madagascar 3, Europe's Most Wanted, is good. Like, I think I actually, I laughed so much watching this movie. Uh, Rise of the Guardians is subpar. Like, I just didn't connect with this one at all. Uh, I think I put it here. The Croods is very mediocre. Herbo is awful. Like, this movie sucks. I cannot believe, like, how bad it is. Um, Mr. Peabody and Sherman, I did not like. There's just nothing that I found appealing about it. How to Train Your Dragon 2 is, I'd say, just good tier. Uh, the Penguins of Madagascar movie is so far. The penguins just aren't that funny when, like, they're made to be, like, more of a protagonist-y, relatable character. Home is one of the worst. Like, I hated this movie so much. Uh, Kung Fu Panda 3 is definitely a drop-off from the first two, but it's still one of the better movies overall. Trolls is awful. I hate Trolls. Like, I put it very near the bottom. Boss Baby also sucks. I think I put it a bit above? I don't know. Uh, Captain Underpants is, like, uh, it's, it's around here. I think I prefer Spirit a little bit. Uh, How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World is, like, pretty close to on par with the first one. Uh, Abominable was bad. Like, this movie was so goddamn boring. I think I put it around here just because the animation was better, but it was, like, so boringly conventional. Trolls World Tour. It sucks. Like, I hate the Trolls movies. Uh, The Crude's A New Age, I put a bit below the first one. Um, I don't even know what the hell this one is. Like, why was this made? It was so boring. Like, it looks, I said, it looks like something that's straight to DVD from, like, 15 years ago. The Boss Baby Family Business is an improvement over the first one. That's not saying much. Uh, I think I put it, like, here. Uh, this was also really bad, like, I, I think it, I think I put it around here. Uh, The Bad Guys was good. I liked The Bad Guys. Um, I put it around here. Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. Best one of the whole bunch. Just wow, I cannot believe how good Puss in Boots, The Last Wish is. And finally, Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken. 
it's just really generic, mostly. Like, uh, I think I put it around here, I think. But, yeah, there you go. There's the uh, DreamWorks tier list. DreamWorks and their sequels, man. Like, all three movies in Amazing Tier are sequels. There is one more thing to talk about before ending off, and that is the future of DreamWorks. Starting off with the stuff that actually has a release date, I already mentioned Trolls 3, which, as of when I'm recording this, is coming out this fall. I'm pretty glad I didn't have to cover this one. DreamWorks has had surprising sequels before, but something tells me that I'm not going to be coming around on the Trolls franchise. I also mentioned that there's going to be a fourth Kung Fu Panda. It's always disappointing when the last movie in a series is easily the weakest, so hopefully this one will amend that. It's directed by the same guy who brought Shrek back a bit after a disappointing third entry, though he did also do Trolls, so you never know. I'm sure it'll be fine, at least. The only other upcoming DreamWorks film to even have a release year right now is this thing called Orion and the Dark. I have absolutely no idea what that is, but it's written by Charlie Kaufman, who, aside from generally being one of the most acclaimed screenwriters ever, also apparently ghostwrote some of Kung Fu Panda 2. So that sounds promising. Everything else listed here doesn't have a release date, which means there's about a sub-50% chance it's even going to come out at all. I guess they're making a Dogman movie, another Dav Pilkey comic I've never read. They're also planning a fourth Madagascar. I don't really see where the series could go from there. The main character's overarching goal throughout the trilogy was to make it back to New York. You have already spent the scene where they make it back to New York and realize it's not what they want anymore. Maybe it's just going to be another Penguins-esque spin-off. Finally, there are also additional sequels planned for Shrek and Boss Baby. They've been saying they're going to make another Shrek since about 2016. Maybe it's more likely now with that tease at the end of The Last Wish, but I take this one with a grain of salt. And Boss Baby 3... That one confuses me. No one likes this series critically, and I don't think the second one even did that well financially. Maybe they're just counting on that underperformance being because of the pandemic. Everything else on this list is a new IP with very little information out about it, so there's not really much I can comment on. I guess the source material for one of them is by the same woman who wrote the How to Train Your Dragon books, but from what I've heard, the movies aren't very faithful adaptations anyway, so I doubt that means much. All I can say is that I hope DreamWorks continues to be the mixed bag that I kind of love them for being, and that if they ever do veer away from that, it's toward a more consistently good output. That period from the mid-2010s to the early 2020s where nearly everything they made ranged from subpar to garbage, and the only exceptions were weaker follow-ups to good stuff they made before that era, that was pretty rough to get through, and I really don't want that to become the prevailing image of what their output is like. It nearly did for me before The Last Wish came out. As for future projects like this, I don't think I'll be doing Disney or Pixar, not anytime soon anyway, because for the most part their output is a bit too consistent for a video like this to be all that interesting for me. One that I am thinking of doing is every nominee for Best Animated Feature, though that one definitely won't be for a while. Even taking out the DreamWorks nominees that I've already watched for this video, that would still be nearly 80 movies I'd have to watch. Though at the same time, that list will only get longer the more I put it off. What I'm probably going to end up doing is gradually take them off over time, instead of doing a full marathon like I did here. If you have any other ideas, let me know in the comments. This video is ridiculously long already, and there is no need to drag it out any longer. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.